Distinguished Presidium members, colleagues, I'd like to thank the organizers of uh, this White Nights Forum, which has already become a tradition. Year after year, this um, meeting is getting more and more sophisticated and uh, interesting. I believe um, the White Nights Forum is very important for the development of an ecology. We are, I believe, a leader. And uh, it's quite unnecessary thing, these uh, meetings of um, oncologists. Can't say of another thing that may outdo the White Nights. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, very much. And the fact that the forum has Discussions is very important since a lot of uh, topical issues are being solved uh, at, uh, during these discussions, not just uh, during the uh, common presentations. Well, my presentation is uh, supposed to provoke a discussion. I will uh, talk about the ovary. Uh, can Cicero uh, distract your attention from the cervical cancer since we have to leave early? So I'd like to have the time to present our point of view regarding the um, ovary cancer treatment and uh, localization. That's uh, uh, one of the most difficult issues in um, oncogynecology. And uh, if um, we read the present day global sources. We can see the light in the end of the tunnel. It seems to be not a hopeless uh, situation. Um, the data regarding the uh, mortality caused by ovarian cancer seems to be the same and still high. This uh, mortality doesn't seem to go down uh, yet. And uh, uh, mortality is the indicator telling whether the treatment um, uh, is effective or not. Early diagnosis, prevention, and uh, uh, treatment are the three columns supporting the good uh, uh, treatment and bringing down the mortality level. If uh, the mortality doesn't decline, it means the previous uh, three columns aren't uh, good enough. There are no uh, efficient solutions um, available. This is the uh, data of um, local studies uh, presenting the level of uh, mortality in uh, ovary cancer of stage three and uh, four. So everything that happens today with the year, all the issues with the ovary cancer, the third and fourth stage where the mortality is very high, has not changed for years. So if it didn't, didn't change for years, we have to understand wh what do we do wrong, what we do not understand. And of course, what we do not understand in the problem of the ovary cancer is pathogenesis and etiology, because if you don't understand the mechanism of the genesis of this disease, you can't have the you can't have the solution and adequate treatment. But because we don't understand the mechanism of the genesis of this cancer. And we now have the vaccine of sorts, vaccine of sorts, and screen for the other types of cancer. And the same situation is for the ovary cancer. What is the outcome for the ovary cancer? Most of the patients receive the primary treatment, cytoreductive surgery, 
adjuvant chemotherapy, but in certain time, most of the patients have recurrence, have a relapse, and more than 80 percent, in more than 80 percent, it is a chemo-resistant, chemo-resistant recurrence. And that is what we have as our outcome, and the patient dies from, from the complication that you all understand, and the median survival for over cancer, over cancer patient is very small, and it does not change. Despite the effect, efficient chemo and targeted drugs that we use today, if we look at the ovary cancer as a whole, there are two types of this. One more localized, where, which is more spontaneously diagnosed during the surgery when the first and second stage localized. And the second, the fourth, the third stage, ascites. And in this case, the prognosis is very bad. And just the simple cytoreductive surgery, even together with peritonectomy, peritoneumectomy, does not help us to prolong the life expectancy of the patient. And it is important to understand what exactly do we call ovaries cancer. This is the cancer of the epithelium of the ovaries. And the important point is what is the epithelium, internal inner epithelium of the ovary. Those are the data I took from monographies from the studies of Glazunov that shows epithelial etiology of the ovary cancer. And the possible etiology origin is either the inner epithelium that is mesothelium or mullium epithelium or postnatal heterotomy, which which is also a component of Müller epithelium. So ovary cancer is the cancer of the lining epithelium. And back then, Glazunov quoted the previous studies or the studies of that time, saying that mesothelium is exactly this lining epithelium. And we wanted to understand the etiology of this epithelium. And according to the contemporary Embryonological st studies shows that it is mesothelium in most cases. And I hope you can see the mesothelium here. And that is, that is the ovary. And that is how the, on the 12th or 14th week, the lining epithelium in the ovary is formed. So just genetically, it is this is similar to mesothelium. It is similar to mesentery. That is why ovary cancer, in some regard, is the cancer of mesentery, localized in the ovaries. And there are points of different points of view, like ovary cancer. Oh, genesis is the tube epithelium, and from the year 2000. We had this idea that we just don't understand this, but it's just a serous epithelium of the fibrio part of the tube. So it's more the tube cancer than the ovary cancer. But be it like that, in this area, we would also visualize the tumor, but we almost never do. So we just try to sort of forcefully pull the serous component to justify our ideas. Because we understand that this component is the origin, to justify the theory that this is the origin of the ovary cancer. But now we are, we understand, we have come to understanding that this is a serious mesothelium cancer. 
and that is how we can combine all the previous ideas into a whole. And I'll show you even more serious studies. On this picture, you can see how the line in epithelium of the ovaries is formed. And those are the studies in the, from the end of 1990s, and you can see that this is the part of mesothelium. That's why if we speak about the ovary cancer and we have to admit that this is the cancer that just genetically is a mesothelial type of cancer. So those are the data from back to 1928 that established the similarities of the of the lining of the ovaries with the mesothelium of the rest of the mesentery and so on. And now you can see the Maximov study, Russian scientist. He was the first who proposed the stem cell definition. And he said that the lining of the ovaries is similar to mesothelium and to the lining and of other parts of the mesentery as well as pericard and pleura. And it has a significant proliferative options. So this process is not localized as it is. It just genetically is a systematic process. Here you can see a very interesting article that was published not, not long time ago that divides the Müller epithelium and Cirrus epithelium of the ovaries, that puts a borderline between these two types of ovary cancer, cancer. And the same article, the same study that shows that it is exactly in Cirrus, in Cirrus and mesothelium type of cancer, when molecular and bio biological markers are almost the same because this is one just a genetical substance serous cancer and mesothelium cancer and this has been shown in this study and it is very different from the from the cancer with Müller component like endometrium and and the mesothelium type of cancer and serous type of cancer so if we speak about ovary cancer, we can define two different types. The cancer that is that originates in the Müller epithelium stem cell tumors. So this is a localized cancer that develops from the primary tumor. And the second type of cancer is the most widespread one is the systematic cancer that has all the potential risks related to mesothelium. And when we have this tumor, this neoplasmatic process, then gistogenesis is not just the area where the tumor and mutation originated initially, but automatically, in this case, the whole abdomen, abdomen and sometimes even plural, plural space, plural cavity, becomes the part of this mutation process. So we won't see the first stage of this process. We will see the systematic process with, together with ascites, and this is the systematic disease that requires the understanding of how the systematic process has to be tackled. It's the systematic therapy, not just the surgery. And if we understand this, then we will start any type of treatment from the system ter systematic therapy, system therapy. Second point, ovary cancer is the disease, the tumor type disease of stem cells. It's important to always remember this. You can see the, all, all the studies related to stem cells. 
tumors on this slide. So if we have all other types of neoplasmatic process, there are only 4 or 5% of stem cells in the tumor. But in ovary cancer, there, there are about 80% of stem cells in the tumor itself. That's why it's so hard to treat this disease, because the modern chemotherapy can't, cannot efficiently work at the level of the stem cells. Stem cells is a very powerful factor that can repair the DNA and can protect itself. That is why the stem cell can survive even in the worst condition. And contemporary therapy only find the somatic cells in mitosis stage, but it can't efficiently influence and kill stem cells tumorous stem cells. That is why the chemotherapy does not give, is not so efficient in ovary cancer, because most of the tumor is composed from stem cells. Another point, ascites in ovary cancer. Ascites is anti-inflammatory niche here, and let's not forget that any oncology always is related to inf inflammation. It starts with inflammation and goes hand by hand with inflammation. Let's admit that the types of inflammation of oncology can be very different. It's not just the banal inflammation related to to, to some different some changes in the organism. The there are numerous types of inflammation. About di six different types of inflammation related to oncological diseases. So you can see the results of our studies for ovary cancer. You see the expression of all cytokine. Itoglycine 6, necrosis factor of the tumor necrosis factor, ascites that is shown here. The, you, you can see the difference of the ascites for the ovary cancer and cirrhosis cancer. And you can see how different they are molecularly and biologically. Because, once again, of those stem cells that have new pathogenetic modifications, they become the uh, they are of changeable type and that's why it's so hard to choose one single type of treatment so if we look at the paradigm of the cancer of the ovaries you can see that there is very large anti-inflammatory component there are also the tumor stem cells that create the high risk of the recurrence and systematic process once again and also numerous lesions that is uh, that spreads throughout the uh, body of the patient and that's why the mortality is so high so our therapy has no possibility to influence the anti-inflammatory factor that is why it cannot prevent the and block the factor of ascites and inflammatory factor that during and we understand that during this inflammatory factor the stem cell can prolong as it is an anti-inflammatory factor the stem cell can prolong its survival it can survive in very um, severe conditions and we can't really influence this and we don't have any multi-targeted therapy to tackle this problem that is why our therapy has no chance of success and we have to understand that we need different options for treatment and the search for these different options gave us a lot of studies related to the use of two mo molecules in oncology and the carbonyl and um, other type of molecule 
epigon ketokine 3 galata EGCG. And the multiple efficiency of indole 3 carbinol or 1,3C, is a therapeutic miracle that shows that this molecule can influence different links of cancerogenesis, even inflammation. That's why we started to use this molecule. In the beginning, as a part of the drug to cure ovary cancer, and we start using it from neoadjuvant chemotherapy with the use of the drug that you show here, the shown here, and we show also the multi-targeted efficiency of this drug for many links of cancerogenesis. It is very important because many sources in literature shows that show how of these drugs what is their what is the how efficient are these drugs for different localizations of the tumors so those are the result five year for five year back from 2004 when you started using this drug these drugs we changed the options of treatment starting from the mandatory chemotherapy and continuing with it and we made two very important observations most of the patients still for most of the patients the first line treatment is efficient and that's in just a limited number of cases that we use the second line and we also remember their non ascites occurrence when inflammation is very localized and the recurrence is also localized. And if it is a situs type of recurrence, then the median survival is no more than three or six months. So the main clinical effect of this drug for over cancer is that we decrease the pool of stem cells in the tumor and we limit the resistance development and also the inflammation that is the basis of the, of the spreading of the cancer in the ovaries. That's, that's why I want to show you the articles with on different, on different uses of these drugs in Joel 3 carbinol and the uh, ECGC as the molecules that influence cancer genesis at different stages, proliferation, apoptosis, and differentiation of stem cells. So this is a multi-targeted effect. And we can continue showing the studies. But I am very much impassioned by this by this justified by many clinics and laboratories by this progress justified by many clinics and laboratories that show that these drugs are good and they work but unfortunately medicine is a very conservative uh, field for something to be really implemented in um, everyday routine, it takes a lot of time. Let me quote a well-known, clever person, Albert Einstein. It's crazy to know about the existence of the new and to continue to do things uh, the old way. We study molecular biology, we understand uh, things about ovary cancer. We now know that uh, there's uh, plenty of new methods, uh, but we continue uh, trying new chemo drugs that will only modify efficacy for uh, three or four weeks. Um, and uh, we only discuss uh, 
the efficacy modification in uh, weeks, depending on this other drug. I think we should uh, switch our attitude, uh, change, modify our attitude to molecular biology, and uh, that will enable us to see the light in the end of the tunnel, since in ovary, in case of ovary cancer, we are still in the darkness. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Neva Ashafian. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions only. The question is not being asked into the mic. It can't be interpreted. Sorry. I wanted to ask you about the following. What do you think about uh, uh, preventive uh, uh, resection or removal of uh, uterus uh, tubes? Uh, now we have uh, this method, removing the tubes and leaving the ovary. I believe it's illogical. Considering what I have mentioned, uh, it's um, not logical to remove uh, the fallopian uh, tubes. Uh, it should not be done. The mic is off, sorry. The mic isn't on, sorry. Sorry, the mic is off, so the interpreter can't hear and thus interpret the question. I know that Passman is not an oncogynecologist uh, and uh, epigolate uh, usage is probably used in case of um, uh, mastopathy, but in case of um, cancer, and when target drugs are being used, when at stake there's human life, and that is so in case of um, ovary cancer, we do study uh, the situation with the thyroid, but um, at present, there were no additional complaints about uh, global lesions of um, or serious lesions of a thyroid. We didn't get that info in our material, but we'll be attentive to what uh, you've mentioned. Thank you. Uh, what I've presented is uh, not a finite uh, study. We're just in the beginning of our uh, research. So some lengthy studied, diverse studies are necessary to answer the questions of Passman and uh, other uh, doctors about uh, the side effects. Uh, thank you, dear colleagues. Let us thank Alev Ashrafian for an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you very much um, indeed. We've tried to let you have your present your presentation at the time available. Well, dear colleagues, uh, we are running a bit late. Hence, I'd like to ask you, and it's up to you, but uh, perhaps uh, we I could take a very short uh, break for two or three minutes, and then we'll continue the second session. Since uh, the speakers are here, they're ready, and we would like to speed up because we also have the lunch uh, symposium. It's also very important. We would like to do it on time. So I announce.